Welcome to basic flight training. The objective of this lesson is to familiarize you with the principles and basic elements of helicopter flight. And by the end of this lesson, you will be able to perform elementary helicopter flight maneuvers, which will simplify the transition into more advanced aircraft. Your first flight will take place in the Sikorsky UH-60 Blackhawk. Let's begin. The main rotor and tail rotor provide the means for movement along your three axes of flight pitch, roll, and yaw. The rotor systems are controlled through the primary flight controls, which are the collective, cyclic, and rudder. Collect controls the amount of lift generated by the main rotor. As you increase collected, the angle of attack of the rotor blades increases, generating more lift, and as a result, an increase in altitude. Reducing collective decreases the pitch of the rotor blades, which will cause the helicopter to lose altitude since there is less lift to hold it up. The amount of collective being applied is measured as torque and is displayed as a percentage of the maximum amount of torque the engines can generate. As you can see, the gauge goes beyond 100%. And when you need extra power, you can over-torque the engine to provide extra lift. Cyclic controls the direction in which the helicopter is traveling. This happens by changing the pitch of the rotor blades at certain points in their rotation. This happens by changing the pitch of the rotor blades at certain points in their rotation. Lift is translated into motion in the direction the blades are tilted. From a hover or at low speeds, cyclic input directly affects your movement. Now, for example, pushing the stick to the left will cause the helicopter to side slip left. Pulling back on the cyclic will cause the helicopter to travel back. Once momentum is built up, the aircraft will begin to fly more like a fixed wing aircraft with lateral stick movements causing the aircraft to bank. The rudder controls the helicopter's movement about its yaw axis. For example, using the left rudder pedal will turn the nose of the helicopter to the left. Rudder controls the amount of force generated by the anti-torque rotor on the tail of the aircraft. When no rudder is applied, the tail rotor evenly balances out the torque generated by the main rotor. Applying rudder will increase or decrease the amount of torque in the tail rotor, causing the tail to swing around relative to which rudder pedal is being used. And this only works at low speeds. Above about 60 knots, rudder input becomes much less effective and you'll need to bank into your turns. Okay? Let's get ready to begin our orientation flight. You must first start the aircraft engine. To do this, press the R key. Okay, once the engine spools up, begin increasing your torque by pressing the plus key. To decrease torque, use the minus key. You can see how much torque is being applied by checking these gauges. Torque is measured as a percentage of the maximum torque the aircraft can generate. Okay, now continue to climb until you reach 200 feet. Your altitude above ground is displayed on the radar altimeter. Use your barometric altimeter to check altitudes above 200 feet. As you approach 200 feet, gradually reduce collective until you come to a hover. Okay, you're now hovering at 200 feet. And first, let's learn about rudder. To yaw the helicopter to the left, press the left bracket key. To yaw to the right, use the right bracket key. Yaw the aircraft left to face 270 degrees by using the left bracket key. You can check your heading by looking on the compass on the horizontal situation indicator.
good. Now rotate right to nine zero degrees by using the right bracket key. Good. Now that was easy, right? Let's get used to using the collective. To increase collective, use the plus key. To decrease collective, use the minus key. I want you to drop the helicopter down to 100 feet. Gradually reduce collective until you begin to descend. As you approach 100 feet, add collective until you begin to hover again. Okay, good. Now, climb back to 200 feet. Slowly increase collective using the plus key. Good. Now we'll get used to moving the helicopter with the cycler. You can move the helicopter sideways when hovering or traveling at low speeds. This is called side slip. Push your stick to the left. Push your stick to the left. Push your stick to the left. Add a little collective if you begin to lose altitude. Center the stick and your momentum will allow you to continue the side slip. Add a little opposite stick to slow down and let's hover again. Apply opposite stick to stop your side slip. Apply opposite stick to stop your side slip. Now let's try to slip to the right. Push your stick to the right. Okay, apply some left cyclic and let's come to a hover again. Stop slipping and put the aircraft into a hover. Stop slipping and put the aircraft into a hover. Let's move forward now. Push your stick forward. You'll need to add some collective to hold your altitude since the lift that was holding your hover is now being used to propel the helicopter forward. Accelerate to 60 knots. Okay, good. Now we'll learn how to stop the helicopter. The goal is to slow down to a hover while staying within about 50 feet of your starting altitude. Begin by reducing your collective to about 50%. Pitch the nose of the aircraft up by pulling back on your cyclic. The more you pull back, the faster you'll slow down. As the aircraft slows down, you'll need to gradually add collective to generate lift for the hover. This is very tricky, so don't get discouraged if you don't do it perfectly the first time. The key is to find the right balance between your collective and sight. If you don't reduce collective enough as you pull back, the aircraft will balloon up because there's still too much lift. Reducing collective too much will cause the helicopter to sink like a rock. Practice makes perfect. You'll have time for that later. Okay, let's see how these controls work together. Push forward on the collective until you reach 60 knots. And move the cyclic to either side. Notice how you bank now instead of slipping. Banking into turns and using the rudders will give you the smallest turning radius. Take a few minutes to get used to flying the aircraft. When you're done, press the escape key.
last thing we'll cover in this lesson is landing. Landing a helicopter is fairly easy. Okay. And reduce collective until you begin to descend. landing. Congratulations. You've just completed your first lesson. You're now ready to move on to more advanced aircraft. See you on the flight line. This lesson will familiarize you with the avionics specific to the Sikorsky U-860 Black Hawk helicopter. Let's begin. Now the first thing you'll notice is that all of the cockpit gauges are analog. The Black Hawk, being a utility helicopter, also lacks a heads-up display, so you'll need to be familiar with all of the gauges and their location. As the pilot in command, you'll be flying in the right-hand seat. The radar altimeter shows you your height above ground. This gauge is useful during low-level flights and only displays up to 215 feet above ground level. There is also a secondary digital readout on this gauge. The barometric altimeter displays your altitude above sea level. The gauge is scaled from 0 to 1,000 feet. This counter shows your altitude in 1,000 foot increments. The vertical speed indicator shows your rate of climb or descent. When the gauge is centered, you are either hovering or maintaining level flight. Rate of descent or climb is displayed in units of hundreds of feet per minute. Take a look at this cluster of gauges. These instruments show you information relating to the engines and rotor. Engine RPM is shown on the left and right sides. Rotor RPM is displayed in the middle. Notice how these gauges are scaled over 100%. 100% torque is the maximum amount of torque the engines can safely generate under normal operating conditions. You can, however, pull more than maximum torque, giving you extra lift in emergency situations. Now, when this happens, these rotor overspeed lights will activate from left to right at rotor speeds of 127, 137, and 142%. Once activated, a latch prevents it from going off until reset by the ground crew. Okay. Let's go ahead and start the engines and prepare for takeoff. To start the engines, press the R key. Okay, good. Gradually increase torque until the aircraft begins to climb. To increase torque, use the plus key. The amount of torque being applied is shown here. As you climb, watch your VSI and both altimeters and see how they change in relation to your current altitude. Now continue climbing and come to a hover at 200 feet. Okay, now that we're airborne, let's continue talking about the flight instrumentation. This is the Vertical Situation Indicator, or VSI. The VSI shows the aircraft's pitch and roll attitude, turn rate, and displays certain navigational information. The artificial horizon shows your aircraft's pitch and roll orientation relative to the ground. The miniature airplane represents your aircraft and is the reference point for determining pitch and roll on this display. 
The horizontal situation indicator, or HSI, works in conjunction with the VSI to provide the pilot course and heading information. The compass shows which direction you are currently heading. The course deviation bar will show you the lateral deviation to the waypoint. When the bar is lined up with the course set pointer and centered on the airplane symbol, you are on course. The to from arrow indicates whether you are traveling toward or away from the current waypoint. Okay, let's move out. Pitch down to gain airspeed and continue to the waypoint. Pitch down to gain airspeed and continue to the waypoint. When traveling between waypoints, there are several autopilot modes you can use. The autopilot system, known as a CISP, or Command Instrument System Processor, is located here. The first mode we'll talk about is called Heading Mode. Heading Mode will maintain your current heading by taking over pitch and roll commands to keep you flying on your current course. To activate the autopilot, press the A key. Notice how the heading light activated on the CIS mode select panel. Navigation mode is the next autopilot mode we'll talk about. Activate the autopilot by pressing the A key. When this mode is selected, you will be put on a course that will take you to the next waypoint. That's all for the autopilot system. Simple, right? Continue to the next waypoint and pull to a hover on a route. Okay, pull to a hover. Thank you. Like I said earlier, this variant of the Blackhawk is used primarily as a utility helicopter. During missions, you can call upon the door gunner to help protect the aircraft. The door gunner mans either an M60 machine gun or an M134 minigun. These weapons are useful for suppressing enemy troops or light unarmored vehicles. Let's try some target practice. To switch to the door gunner position, press the numpad insert key. Right, you are now manning the door gun. To shoot, aim the gun at your target and pull the trigger. Scattered around you are clusters of targets. See if you can hit them. Take as much time as you need for target practice. When you're finished, press the escape key. Okay, now I'll talk about the defensive systems aboard the aircraft. The most important piece of equipment is the APR-39 radar warning receiver. The RWR displays information that alerts you to what kinds of radar threats are on the battlefield. Look at the display. Notice the 9, 11, and the letter A. The symbols correspond to SA-9 and SA-11 SAMs, and the A represents a AAA unit. When a threat is first detected, you will hear a beep and its symbol will appear on the display. You will also hear a voice message from the APR-39 identifying the type of threat and whether it is in search, track, 
on launch mode. Its location is shown relative to you, with your aircraft being at the center of the display. The position of the threat symbol on the display gives you an indication of its distance and bearing. When the threat locks onto you, you will hear a steady tone and a triangle will appear around the center. When the threat fires, the symbol will begin to flash and you will hear a series of beeps. Let's watch this happen. In front of you is an SA-11 SAM site. Begin flying towards it. Don't worry, they can't hurt you. Okay, the SAM site just locked onto you. Notice how the diamond appeared around his symbol and you got the lock tone. You've just been fired on. Notice the flashing symbol and the audible launch tone. Learn to react to this information quickly. An extra second can save your life. Now that you know how to identify radar threats, what should you do when they're found? The most important thing to remember is that if you fly nap of the Earth below 100 feet, enemy radar has a much more difficult time detecting you. If you are detected, drop as much altitude as possible and try to get hills or mountains between you and the radar source to block or disrupt the signal. Chaff consists of many strips of radar reflective aluminum that will appear similar to your aircraft in the missile's guidance system. The idea is to pop chaff while making rapid course changes. If done properly, the missile will be fooled into homing onto the chaff instead of you. Infrared missile avoidance works a little differently. IR missiles home onto the heat generated by your engines. The device used to spoof IR missiles is the ANALQ-144, also known as the Disco Ball. Now, the Disco Ball uses high and low frequency radiation, transmitted by an electrically heated source to confuse IR missiles, causing them to get This device is fully automated, so all you need to do is make sure it's activated when you begin the mission. To activate the infrared jammer, press the I key. Well, that about wraps up this lesson. If you'd like, you can continue flying around the area, putting some of this new knowledge to use. You might want to fly around the SAM sites and see how your RWR reacts to them. When you're ready to end the lesson, press the escape key. Today's lesson will cover the cockpit systems of the OH-58D Kiowa Warrior. The Kiowa is a highly modified version of a civilian helicopter airframe, the Bell Jet Ranger. However, it's readily apparent the similarities end there, as evidenced by the mast-mounted sight and dark paint.
This bird's job is not to shuttle happy little civilians around. Let's go ahead and begin. The pilot occupies the right-hand seat, while the co-pilot gunner sits in the left-hand seat. You can switch between the two seats by pressing the keypad insert key. The two seats are functionally identical. However, only the pilot has the PDU. Let's begin by taking a look at our instruments. The PDU, or pilot's display unit, is essentially a small heads-up display used for targeting. We'll cover this in detail later. There are several analog gauges that display basic flight information. Along the top of the cockpit are an airspeed indicator, artificial horizon, and an altimeter. These gauges are standard equipment and are identical to those found in the Black Hawk and Longbow, so I don't need to go into detail on how those work. The center MFD is used to display your digital moving map, while this other display will cycle through the MFD pages available to you, which we'll cover in a bit. Engine information is displayed on the center gauges. The top left gauge represents your turbine gas temperature or engine temperature. To the right is your torque indicator. The rotor RPM is shown on the bottom left gauge with engine RPM shown next to it. On the far right hand side is a clock. Let's get ready to take off. Disengage the rotor brake and climb to a hover at 100 feet. Let's begin by taking a look at the multifunction displays available to you. The TSD in the Kiowa is identical to the one found in the Longbow. I'll review some of its functionality for you. Your aircraft is represented at the bottom center of the display. Waypoint information is displayed to the left. Included are the waypoint number you're traveling to, the distance to that waypoint, and on the bottom, the time to arrival at your present speed. To the right, targeting information is shown. If you have a target locked, its range will be shown here. The range to which the TSD is currently displaying information is shown in the top right. In this case, it's at the five kilometer range. Next is your MMS display. This MFD displays sight information from the mast mounted sight above the helicopter's rotor. There are two modes available, TIS, which stands for the thermal imaging system, and TVS, which stands for the television system. I'll describe how to use this system later. Next is the VSD, or vertical system display. The MFD differs depending on whether the aircraft's master arm is on or off. Master arm refers to whether or not the weapon system is armed or in standby mode. If the master arm is off, this MFD displays navigational information. You can check whether or not the master arm is activated here on the PDU. An artificial horizon is shown, along with your current airspeed, altitude above ground, the waypoint number you're traveling towards, and the distance to that waypoint. Also shown are an altitude bar, representing your distance above ground and a vertical speed indicator. The display changes when the master arm is activated. To activate the master arm, press the Control M key. Do this now. Notice how the display has changed to show weapons and targeting information. We'll cover this MFD in detail later. The systems page displays the operating status of the systems aboard your aircraft. When these systems are operational and undamaged, their status is shown as OK. If the system is slightly damaged, Marge will be shown, meaning marginal. Inop will be displayed if the system is inoperative. The COM page is used to display the call sign designation for other units on the battlefield. The ASE, or Aircraft Survivability Equipment page, displays information about the various SAM and AAA threats on the battlefield. The ASE is composed of several systems working in unison. These systems include the ANAPR-39 radar warning receiver, a radio frequency interferometer used to interpret the type of threat based on the strength and wavelength of the detected radar emissions. The ANAVR2 laser warning receiver, a chaff dispenser, and radar and infrared jammers. Your aircraft is shown in the center of the display, providing you with a 360 degree view around you. The range out to which the ASE is displaying is shown in the top right. You can cycle between two, five, 10, 25, and 50 kilometer ranges 
by left-clicking on the number with your mouse control or by pressing the delete key. The ASE page will automatically come up in your MFD when an enemy SAM or AAA unit detects you. This is called the ASE Auto Page feature. You can disable this feature by pressing the Shift A key. Identified threats will appear as a symbol on the ASE display. The symbology is fairly self-explanatory. Each type of SAM will appear with its number. For example, an SA-8 will appear as an 8, an SA-11 as an 11, a ZSU-23 AAA unit will appear as a 2-3, and so on. A circle will also be drawn around the symbol, representing the maximum distance it can engage you at. Fly into that circle, and you're within that threat's range and can be fired on. If the circle is dashed, that means the threat is currently in search mode. If the circle becomes solid, the threat has located a target and is in tracking mode. If there is a line drawn from the threat to you, you are being tracked. If the circle starts to flash, the threat is firing on you, which should result in immediate defensive action. A solid diamond represents an approaching missile. Hopefully you won't see too many of those. If the ASE detects an enemy tracking or firing on you, it will automatically kick in your jammers. The jammer text will change to IR jam and a flashing lightning bolt will appear on your aircraft symbol. You can also activate the jammers manually. To activate the infrared jammer, press the I key. Remember, flying low and using the surrounding terrain will greatly decrease your chances of detection. This is especially important to remember when flying the Kiowa for several reasons. Being a scout helicopter, you will usually be tasked with reconnaissance missions. You really don't want to let the enemy know you are observing their positions, as they will most likely move positions if they know they have been discovered, rendering any intelligence you've gained useless. Furthermore, the Kiowa is not as heavily armed or armored as the Longbow, making you much more vulnerable to enemy fire. The easiest way to avoid detection is to fly very low to the ground, called nap of the earth. Staying low puts you below the minimum altitude that enemy radar can detect you at. Let's fly nap of the earth to waypoint two. I want you to stay below 75 feet. Pitch the nose of the helicopter down to build up some speed and proceed to the next waypoint, flying below 75 feet. Along the way, experiment with the flight controls a little to get a feel for the aircraft. It handles much more responsibly than a Black Hawk or Longbow due to its smaller size and lighter weight. When you arrive at waypoint two, pull to a hover. Pull to a hover. Be sure to stay below the ridge line in front of us. If you need to, engage the auto hover feature by pressing the H key. Okay, the primary purpose of the Kiowa is tactical reconnaissance. To do this, the helicopter carries a mast mounted sight, or MMS. You must find the enemy without being seen yourself. To accomplish this, you can use the terrain to mask yourself and peek the MMS over the tops of hills and mountains to see what is happening on the other side while you remain hidden from view. Hopefully, let's give this a try. Beyond the ridge line in front of us is an enemy FARP, a forward arming and refueling point. I want you to observe the FARP without being detected by them. Your RWR will alert you if detected. Add some collective until the MMS can see above the hill and hover. Good, they can't see you. Let's take a look at the MMS display. Along the top of the display is a compass. 
showing your magnetic heading. To the right are two readouts showing where the MMS is currently pointing. Top line indicates the vertical elevation of the site, which can slew plus or minus 30 degrees. The second line shows the horizontal slew of the MMS, which can travel 170 degrees left or right. Range to target is shown on the left side of the display. Using the laser for range information will provide the most accurate estimate. To activate the laser, use a keypad enter key. These gates are the center of the viewing area and are what you should use to line up your targets. Brackets will appear around the threat when it is targeted. To lock onto a target, use the L key. The currently selected camera is shown and will display TIS for the thermal imaging system or TBS for the television system. You switch between these cameras by pressing the keypad one key. The zoom level is shown to the right. TIS can be zoomed at either six or 25 times. TVS zooms between five or 17 times magnification. To zoom in, use keypad plus key. To zoom out, use a keypad minus key. The weapon inhibit field displays information as to whether or not you have a valid lock. If you do not have a target selected, it will display no target. If you have a target selected, but it's within the minimum range of your current weapon, it will display min range. The display reads no acquire. That means you have a target selected, but are not lazing it. You'll only see the no acquire message when using hellfires, since you must have the target lazed for the missile to lock onto it. When you have a good lock and the target is within firing constraints, valid lock will be shown. To pan left, press the keypad left arrow key. To pan right, press the keypad right arrow key. To pan down, use the keypad down arrow key. You can automatically cycle through visible targets by pressing T key. At this point, I'd like to elaborate on how to use the VSD for firing weapons. To recap, the VSD or vertical system display will show either navigational or weapon system information, depending on whether or not the master arm is activated. For now, let's make sure it's armed, so the PDU should be showing arm. If it isn't, activate the master arm by pressing the Control M key. We'll cover the Hellfire missile first. The OH-58D can carry up to four laser Hellfires, two on each pylon. We are currently carrying two Hellfires, plus a pod of smoke rockets. Some of the flight information remains, such as the compass, airspeed indicator, and the altimeter. The currently selected weapon is shown. The range to target is shown in the bottom right. The box in the middle represents missile constraints. When the box changes from dash to solid, you have a good lock. When centered, the target is in front of you. The larger box also represents the missile constraints. When solid, you have a good lock. The smaller box is functionally the same as the diamond symbol on the VSD and should be used to determine which way the target is oriented to. The master arm indicator shows that the weapon system is active. Turn towards your target until the box becomes solid and fire. Turn towards your target until the box becomes solid and fire. Turn towards your target until the box becomes solid and fire.
Good job. Change your active weapon to rockets by pressing the backspace key. Switch to rockets by pressing the backspace key. Switch to rockets by pressing the backspace key. The display has changed to show an I-beam cursor, the device used to aim your rockets. Using your PDU, you want to align the I-beam so the target box is centered within the cursor. The diamond symbol on the VSD will also give an indication for lining up on the target. Also shown is the ripple rate for the rocket pods, which determines how many rockets are fired in one salvo, and the type of rockets being carried. To change the ripple rate, use the S key. Let's switch to four rocket ripple. We're currently armed with smoke rockets, although when arming the helicopter, you also have a choice of loading high explosive or submunition rockets. Smoke rockets are useful during reconnaissance missions for marking the location of the enemy, making it easy for your buddies to find that spot to finish the job. Good job. Now let's go ahead and start traveling toward waypoint three. The last thing I have to talk to you about is the digital moving map display. This map is based on existing geographical and navigational data and will not reflect any target information. Use the TSD for locating targets. The scale the moving map is displayed in is the same as that of the TSD. So changing TSD range will also change the moving map's scale and vice versa. The contour map lies underneath the grid lines, which reflects terrain elevation in the area of operations. You can turn the contour map on and off by left-clicking the map off text. The lighter the color of the contour, the higher the elevation at that point. The thin green lines make up one kilometer grids, while the bold green lines mark five kilometer grids. Map coordinates appear at the intersection of the five kilometer grids. Your location is also shown at the bottom of the moving map display. Your location is shown by the small helicopter symbol will always remain in the center of the display. The helicopter will rotate about the center point to reflect your current heading. In the bottom right corner is a mission clock showing the elapsed time since you began the mission. Navigational information is also shown on the map. Like the TSD, waypoints appear as circles with numbers and the currently selected waypoint will be flashing. Lines drawn between each waypoint represent your mission route. Distance and time to arrival to the waypoint are shown as well. The current map zoom level is displayed and can be cycled by left-clicking on the number with your mouse or by using the page down key. Okay, that wraps up this lesson. At waypoint three is a FARP. I'd like you to land there. Along the way are several enemies you can engage with your remaining weapon stores. You've done well, pilot. Enjoy the rest of your flight.
Okay, get comfortable. We have a long ride ahead of us. Today, we'll be learning about the systems that comprise the Longbow Cockpit and Avionics Suite. The heads-up display in the Longbow is referred to as the IHADS, or Integrated Helmet and Display Sighting System. The IHADS works a little differently than the standard aircraft HUD. Information is displayed through a monocle attached to the pilot's helmet and appears to be hanging in space in front of you as opposed to being displayed on a glass pane. There are four IHADS modes, each of which displays slightly different flight information. Hover mode displays basic flight information. The amount of torque being applied is displayed here. This is your airspeed indicator shown in knots. The radar altimeter shows your height above the ground. The next mode is called Bob Up. This mode is used when performing pop-up attacks from behind hills. The box indicates your position relative to a spot below you on the ground. Use this display to help maintain a hover while performing your attack. Transition mode is very similar to hover mode. The main difference is the inclusion of the attitude indicator, which gives you a reference as to which way the aircraft is traveling. Cruise mode also builds on hover mode and includes a few additional displays. There is a pitch ladder, which shows the angle of pitch the aircraft is currently in, and a roll indicator, which shows your angle of bank. There are several indicators on the IHADs that are always displayed. Across the top of the display is your compass. The center line indicates your magnetic heading. For navigational purposes, the open carrot points to the heading to your next waypoint. The closed carrot shows which way the TAD sensors are pointing, and this indicates the scanning direction of the FCR. Okay, let's prepare to take off. First, you must disengage the rotor brake. Press the R key. Okay, now climb to 150 feet and come to a hover. The radar altimeter displays your altitude above ground. To increase collective, press the plus key. To decrease collective, press the minus key. You can engage the auto hover system by pressing the H key. Let's continue learning about the cockpit instrumentation. As I just mentioned, your distance above ground is displayed on the radar altimeter. This bar also gives you a quick indication of your altitude. When you're on the ground, the bar will be bottomed out. As you climb, the bar rises. The bar only displays up to 200 feet and will disappear after that. The altitude bar is extremely useful in judging your height during low level flight. The barometric altimeter displays your altitude above sea level. Barometric altitude is more important to know during cross-country flights. Since you'll generally be flying combat missions, you should be more concerned with your altitude above ground. The vertical speed indicator shows whether the aircraft is climbing or descending. When centered, you're either hovering or maintaining level flight. Navigational information is displayed here. During a mission, your flight path is determined by a set of waypoints. Waypoints are imaginary points in space that are used as reference points for you to fly towards. The waypoint number and the distance to that waypoint is shown, as well as the time required to reach the waypoint at your current speed. The TSD displays your route and helps you see where your next waypoint is. When you reach your currently selected waypoint, the display will automatically cycle to the next waypoint on your route. If necessary, you can manually cycle waypoints. To select the next waypoint on the list, press the W key. To cycle to the previous waypoint, press the Shift W key. Okay, orient your aircraft towards the open carrot on the compass. Good. Now, pitch the nose of the aircraft down to gain airspeed and continue to the waypoint. Okay, I now want you to engage the autopilot. Press the A key. The Longbow's autopilot system is fairly easy to use. There are two modes to choose from. The first is called Attitude Hold. 
and will hold your current heading and altitude and is shown as AP1 on the iHads. Press the A key again. You are now in navigation autopilot mode. This mode will take you on the heading to your next waypoint and is displayed as AP2 on your iHads. You can adjust your autopilot speed by pressing the control key along with the left and right arrows. To adjust your autopilot altitude, use the control and up and down arrow keys. Okay, I'm going to take control of the aircraft now. In addition to the various flight information, the iHads also displays information from the TADS and FCR. The TADS, or Target Acquisition and Designation System, is the visual sighting system employed in the longbow. This system includes the forward-looking infrared as well as several other cameras used to find and designate targets. The box in the bottom center is called the FOR, or Field of Regard box. The FOR box represents the total area the TAD sensors can scan, about 220 degrees wide. The small box in the center shows the field of view of the TADs. The dashed line shows where the fire control radar is currently looking. To the left of the FOR box is the high action display, or HAD, which displays target information. The number on top is the range to your current target. This can be based on input from the TADs or FCR. We'll cover how to do that in the next lesson. The bottom line displays information about the sighting systems. The IHADS also displays information about the weapon systems aboard the aircraft. Your currently selected weapon is displayed here. RKT stands for rockets. MSL stands for the Hellfire Missile, either radar or laser. And ATA is short for your air-to-air -air missile, the Stinger. Another part of the high action display is the weapon inhibit field. When you can't fire the weapon, a message here will inform you as to why not. Usually because you lost line of sight to the target, or it's out of range. Let's look at the symbology for each weapon in detail. The chain gun is always armed. Unless you manually track the gun, it will always be locked onto your current target. If you don't have a target selected, the gun will bore sight straight ahead. You can select the burst rate of the chain gun by pressing the G key. You can choose between 10, 20, 50, and 100 round bursts. Your folding fin aerial rockets are essentially small, unguided missiles. The I-beam cursor is used to aim the rockets. When the cursor is over a target and you are within firing constraints, the cursor will become solid and you can launch. For air-to-air -air engagements, you can carry four Stinger missiles mounted on the tips of the helicopter's stub wings. When selected, a set of concentric rings will appear. Their movement represents the movement of the missile's seeker head. To fire, steer towards your target. When you get a lock, the circles will fix on the target, and you'll hear a steady lock tone. The symbology for the Hellfire missile is a little more complex. We'll cover this in detail later, so for now, here's a brief description. There are two modes from which you can launch. Lock on before launch mode, or LOBL, is used when you already have your target locked. The box represents the firing constraints of the Hellfire. When the box is solid, you have a good lock and can fire. If the box is dashed, the missile hasn't locked onto the target yet. The constraint box in lock on after launch mode is much bigger. The LOAL mode allows you to fire a missile before you actually have the target locked. The missile will loft higher than usual, allowing more time for the seeker head to find its target. To switch between LOAL and LOBL mode, use the insert key. As I said before, we'll cover the weapon systems in excruciating detail in the next lesson. I'd like to move on to discuss the multifunction displays now. Both cockpits in the longbow contain two multifunction displays which are used to display a wide variety of very useful information. This information is categorized and broken down into separate pages. To cycle through the displays on the left MFD, use the comma key. To cycle through the displays on the right MFD, use the period key. The engine page displays information about the rotor and engine systems. The amount of torque being applied is shown along with readouts for rotor and engine RPM. 
The weapon page displays your loadout information along with sight information. The aircraft symbol is used to show how many of each weapon type you have left. The currently selected weapon is shown as a solid color. Hellfire missiles are shown here. The R shows you are carrying radar hellfires. An L would be shown for laser hellfires. The number of rockets on board is displayed along with what type. MP stands for MPSM rockets. RC stands for high explosive rockets. The number of Stinger missiles is shown here. The amount of chain gun ammo available is displayed on the gun counter along with the burst setting. At the top of the page is the master arm indicator. When the weapon systems are activated, this will read arm. To arm or disarm the weapon system, use the control M key. To the left and right are the sight indicator. This will read either TADS or FCR, depending on which system is currently in use. You can toggle between the two by pressing the home key. The launch mode indicator is located just left of the gun counter. This will display either LOAL or LOBL for whichever mode you are currently in. To the right of the gun counter is the ranging indicator. The range to target can be determined by either the laser range finder or by the fire control radar. LRF corresponds to the laser range finder and FCR of course stands for the fire control radar. Lastly, the amount of chaff remaining is displayed on the bottom left. The flight page basically repeats important information from the IHADS onto its own MFD page. You can check your airspeed, torque, heading, and other pertinent information here. The TADS page relays information from the various optical sensors to an MFD. The currently selected camera is displayed and will show FLIR for forward-looking infrared, DTV for the day television, or DVO for the direct view optics. We'll discuss these in more detail in the next lesson. The TADS will lock on to your currently selected target by default. To zoom in on a target, use the Z key. To zoom out, use the X key. The current level of zoom the camera is in is shown on this display and is indicated by an N for narrow, M for medium, and W for wide field of view. The TSD or tactical situation display is the most crucial display aboard the aircraft. All relevant battlefield information is displayed here, including all TADS and FCR targets, enemy lines, air defense threats, and waypoint information. Your aircraft is displayed on the bottom. All known targets are displayed with corresponding symbology. Tanks are represented by an H symbol. Air defense vehicles are represented by a triangle with a number that corresponds to the type of vehicle it is. For example, a ZSU-23 would show a triangle with a 2-3 underneath it. Circles represent wheeled vehicles such as trucks. Squares represent buildings. If you have line of sight to the target, its symbol will be solid. Your designated target will have a diamond around its symbol. Priority fire zones, or PFZs, are also displayed on the TSD. A PFC will target all vehicles within the area drawn. This is very useful in taking out groups of targets quickly. Again, we'll cover these in more detail in the next mission. Your waypoint information is displayed in the lower left. The range to your current target is displayed in the lower right. The range out to which the TSD is displaying information is shown in the top right. You can toggle between 2, 5, 10, 20, and 50 kilometer range by using the page down key. At times, this display will become very busy with all the information being displayed, so you can choose to display only certain types of information. This is called decluttering the display. You can toggle between showing only waypoint information, only target information, or both simultaneously by pressing the D key. The ASE, or Aircraft Survivability Equipment page, displays air defense threats only. This system is made up of the radar warning receiver, the radio frequency interferometer, the radar and infrared jammers, and a chaff dispenser. 
Your aircraft is shown in the middle, giving you a 360 degree view around you. The RWR and RFI determine the type of threat and its location and display them relative to your position. The engagement range of the threat is displayed as a circle. Like the TSD, the ASE displays symbols with numbers corresponding to the type of threat. The radar and infrared jammer status is displayed, as well as the number of chaff pods available. This page will automatically come up in the left MFD when a threat detects you. If you so choose, you can toggle that feature by pressing the Shift A key. Besides a graphical representation, the ASE provides voice messages when a threat detects you, including what type of threat, its location relative to you, and whether it is tracking or launching on you. The last MFD I'll talk about is the radar page. This page displays raw returns from the FCR. Only the location of the target is shown, since the TSD is responsible for classifying this information. The radar can be set to one of two modes, either air to ground or air to air. Air mode shows targets in a 360 degree sweep around you. You can toggle between ground and air mode by pressing the page up key. The range of this display is toggled by pressing the page down key. The up front controller displays radio information along with warning messages. If you experience a system failure, a message describing the problem will appear here. Now, all of these MFDs can be selected individually, or you can use master modes to display them in groups. Each mode will pull up the MFDs which contain the most useful information for that mode. The currently selected master mode is shown on the I halves. To cycle between them, use the M key. The master modes include navigation mode, air-to-air -air mode, direct fire, and indirect fire. As a backup to the digital systems in the cockpit, there are several analog gauges that also display flight information. Included are an artificial horizon, an airspeed indicator, and an altimeter. Okay. That about wraps up this lesson. You should now have a basic understanding of the longbow cockpit, instrumentation, and avionics. We'll take a more in-depth look at the weapon and sighting systems in the next lesson. See you then.